Man, what a day we had yesterday, and the Lord blessed us with the, the sun was shining yesterday. Last year, it was raining, and we were serving people. This year, we were serving people in the sun, and I just want to uh, honor all those who came out, all those who prayed, all those who gave, um, just the, the heart that you guys had. I'm just proud, uh, proud of you guys. I was re- just reminded and thinking about the one team who uh, went out, and, and they were just going to... Uh, replace the top deck for this uh, single mom. And as they ripped off the, the top part of the deck, they realized all the boards underneath the top of the deck were rotted. And so they had to go to the store and get wood. And every one of the team members said, we'll stay longer. We'll still later. We'll stay, stay later. We're not going anywhere. We're going to make sure that this job gets finished. And just want to honor you guys. Everybody had that heart <laughs> yesterday just to serve and make a difference. And so... So, so good. Also want to say uh, hello to Aaron and Marissa Rosario in the house. Love you guys. So proud of you. And we love when you come back home. And uh, we, I, I pray that you would just be refreshed today. Come on, stretch your hand out to them right now. Father, we thank you for this amazing couple whom we are so proud of and we believe in so much, God, and the anointing, the call that's on their lives, the family that they are to us. God, I pray even right now as they just take a breath on this Sunday morning that you would bring times of refreshing to their souls. God, that you would fill them, God, that you would continue to do what only you can do in and through their lives. God, I pray that they would feel love today in your house. I pray your presence would be upon them. I pray you would speak to them during the message. God, just have your way. We speak a blessing over them in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Well. I want to welcome everybody today. I uh, also want to look into the camera and say a big hello to all those joining us online, along with all the men and women in our correctional ministry, wherever they're at. We love you. We're honored to have you a part of our church. Come on, D-Town. Have me welcome our church family today. It's awesome. Well, today we are in week number two of our Sizzlin' Summer Series where uh, we have different communicators along with myself just bringing a fresh word to the church. What's God speaking to us now? What does the church need to hear? And last week, Aaron Hobson did an incredible job kicking the series off as he talked about... Uh, contributing more, right, and and really the heart of servanthood, and did an incredible job. Then you guys put it in practice yesterday on Serve Day, uh, but just so uh, just so proud of Aaron, and just believe in the call and the anointing on his life. I'm so grateful for his heart. How many know when you have humility, you have a teachable heart? God can do a lot with those qualities, and and so just honor you, bro. And and I had actually someone come up to me yesterday at during Serve Day, and they said, "Hey, Pastor God, is Aaron speaking tomorrow?" And I said, "No, no." I'm speaking, he goes, <laughs> So I kicked him out of the church. He's no longer with us. But no, I love it. I, love, I just love the team. How I many know we can take a vacation and, and the church is in good hands? And we got good leaders, good pastors, and so grateful for that. But today, as we continue on in this series, I, I, I want to talk to us about something God laid on my heart a, a few weeks ago, and that, and that is, uh, what do we do when life becomes difficult? Like, what do we do when times get tough, when we get the bad report, the diagnosis, when maybe we're going through a breakup, a divorce, or maybe we're experiencing the, the pain of, uh, of someone the, and the loss of someone that we loved? Well, what do, we, what do we do? How do we get through some of life's toughest moments? And so the title of the message today, I want to talk to us about how to find strength in God. How do we find strength in God? And my hope is to encourage those of us who maybe have had the, the wind knocked out of our sails. Uh, maybe life has blindsided us and knocked us down, whether it's the death of, uh, of a loved one or the diagnosis from the doctor that we didn't see coming. Or maybe we were so excited to become a mom or a dad and out of, out of nowhere the miscarriage happens and life just knocks the wind out of our sails. How do we find strength in those moments of our lives? Whether it's in a relationship that just seems to be growing more and more distant or an addiction that we just can't seem to get the victory over. What do we do when all feels lost, when hope is just not there? And I just want to encourage us today that as Christians, 
as believers, as followers of Jesus, that we have something the rest of the world doesn't have. In fact, when we find ourselves in some of the most difficult, loneliest moments of our lives, that we can find strength in God. Now, this is extremely important because where we look to find our strength will determine our ability to get over those things. And when I say get over, I'm not just trying to get over it, get in the past. I'm talking about getting over it. That that thing used to have me, but now I'm over that thing. God wants us to get over the things in our lives. And so uh, this is so important because if we look for strength in ourselves, I don't know if we look for strength in another, another person, if we look for strength in our resources or our careers, if we're trying to find strength in any other place other than God, how many of us know it will ultimately fail us? And so the question is, how do we find strength in God in some of the most difficult moments of our lives? And kind of to unpack this idea, I want to take a look at some of the life, can't look at all of his life, but some of the life of a character in the Bible named David. And I want to start by by taking a look at a song that he wrote in the Bible. In fact, I'm just curious, how many music lovers we have in the house? Anybody just love some music? Me and my family, we love music. Pastor Justina hates music, but the rest of us, we love it. In fact, even my, my youngest, uh, B-Rax, when he was just a baby, or maybe a toddler, I should say, he would just hum all the time, just loves music. In fact, just the other day, uh, just yesterday, we were driving home from a baseball game, and he said, Dad, can you put on some music? And so I started singing. He goes, Dad, no, music. I go, that's kind of music, isn't it? And uh, But he just wants to listen to music. So we just love music in my family. I'm just curious what kind of music we love in the house. How many country fans do we have in the house? My car broke down. My dog died. Come on, where are my country fans at? I can't. I cannot get with country. It's probably uh, my least favorite uh, type of music. I have country music fans right up there with cat lovers. Like, I don't even know if y'all are going to make it into heaven. I'm not sure. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. How many of us like a little rock and roll? Come on, how many of us, where are my rock and roll people at? All right, okay. How many of us like a little bit, something with a little more rhythm, a little more beat? I mean, any rap or R&B fans in the house? Okay, okay. How about, where's my holy rollers at? You just want some good praise and worship music. Where are my Christians at? Where are my Christians at? All right, y'all are outnumbered today. I'm just saying, no. Uh, well, when it comes to praise and worship, this would be, have been the category that David would have been in. And I want to take a look at a line from one of his songs that's found in the book of Psalms. And the word psalm simply means sacred songs. And we know that David wrote at least 73 of the 150 psalms or sacred songs in the Bible. And so let's take a look at this line from one of his songs, Psalm chapter 18, verse 29. He says, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Now, that might not sound like a catchy song or uh, something that, that we might listen to, but what's powerful about this psalm or this sacred song that David wrote is what he's facing in his life that caused him to write these lyrics. And to kind of give us some context into which this song was birthed in his life, let's take a look at where it came from, 2 Samuel chapter 22. We're just going to read three verses from this chapter. We'll start in verse 1. It says this, that David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And this chapter, chapter 22 of 2 Samuel, contains 50 verses of lyrics, starting with verse 2 where he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. This is who my God is, and we don't have time to to study the entire song, but let's jump to verse 30, the middle part of this song that David wrote. Take a look at what verse 30 says. With your help, God, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Now, what's interesting is, you know, the rest of the chapter is this song, and then chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, the very next chapter begins by saying, These are the last words of David. In fact, scholars all agree that Psalms 18 was the last song that David ever wrote. 
Now, we know that David lived to be around 70 years old, and this is the song that David wrote at the very end of his life, a, a life that was full of failures and a life that was full of victories, a life where he made a lot of mistakes and a, lot, a life where he had a lot of success. David is looking back over the course of his life and all that he accomplished. I mean, David was a king. D David was famous. He was well-known. He was wealthy. He had a lot of influence and a lot of power. He, he knew what it was like to lose everything and then get it all back again. In other words, David has seen some stuff throughout his life, and now his life is coming to an end. And he says, give me a pen and give me some paper, and he begins to write these words, the very last song that he would ever write. And he starts going down a memory lane, and he's thinking about all the things that God has brought him through. He's thinking about all the battles that he was in, the joys and the sorrows of his life. And the testimony of this dying man is that God has been faithful to me. And I don't know who needs to hear that today, who needs to be reminded of this reality that God is faithful. No matter what season, no matter what circumstance you might find yourself, no matter how dark or lonely your life may get, can I just remind us today that our God is faithful. And, and maybe for others of us, we just need to tuck this truth away for a later time because we might say, well, everything's really good right now and I don't have any problems, but how many of us know life happens sometimes and we all have that day, that day when we feel like quitting, that day when we feel like giving up and it's in those moments we can pull this truth out of our pocket and remind ourselves, my God is faithful. And I love what the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. It says, if we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. How many of us know God's faithfulness in our lives is not based upon our behavior? It's based on his character. His faithfulness to you and me is not based on what we do or what we don't do. His faithfulness to our lives is based on who he is. That even when we are unfaithful, come on, my God, your God remains faithful. David is in this moment where he's writing these words. He's saying, with God's help, I can, I can run. I can advance through a troop. With God's help, I can, I can scale the wall. Now, I don't know about you, but I can relate to what David is singing about. I can relate to what he's writing down. Let me, let me put it in my, my own words, what David is saying, that, that God has gotten me through some things that I didn't think I could make it through. That God has blessed me in more ways than I could have ever even imagined. That when I look back over the course of my life, I remember the ups, I remember the downs, I remember the obstacles, I remember the difficulties, I remember the struggles. But because God's hand was upon my life, I got through it. Can anybody else relate to the words that David is singing about today? Like, I shouldn't be standing where I'm standing but God. But God got me through. My marriage should have made it through, but here we are. I wanted to quit so many times, but God. I wanted to throw in a towel and walk away, but God got me through. The only way I'm standing where I'm standing is because God's hand was on my life. God got me through it. David. Now David is having these flashbacks of fortune and failure and hills and valleys, victories, and defeats, and when he thinks about the goodness of God and all the things that God has done for him, his final words are, God got me through it. God got me through it. He didn't, he didn't deliver me from it. He empowered me to walk through it. He didn't get me out of it. He gave me the strength to walk through it. I didn't understand why I had to go through what I was going through then, but as I look back over the course of my life, I see something now that I didn't know then, that I have a greater awareness of God's goodness now that I didn't have before. I, I, got, a, I got a greater dependence on God that I used to have on myself. And I have a greater desperation for God in my life because I realize now, after walking through that storm and that season, how limited I am, but how powerful my God is. I didn't know it then. But I know it now. My God is faithful, and he helped me get through. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? Anyone ever found themselves in a situation where, like, 
I can't see my way out of this one. I don't know what I'm going to do. Anybody ever been sick and just wondered, will I ever get well? Am I ever going to be over this thing? Am I always going to feel this way? Am I always going to deal with these headaches? Am I always going to deal with this addiction? Is this always going to be a part of my life? I keep going back. Is anybody else just in a situation like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you ever experienced a tragedy in your life that brought a brokenness in your heart to the point that there was only one person you could cry out to? There was only one name that you could utter that would bring comfort to your heart. There's only one name that could bring a peace. There was only one name that understood the storm that was happening inside of you. But because of God, come on, but because of God, I made it through it. I made it through the bad news. I made it through the heartbreaks. I made it through the addictions. I made it through the depression. He brought me through it. And because he got me through that, my God will get me through this. He's faithful. Even when I'm in a dark place, come on, he's faithful. And so as we look at just some of the life of of David and hopefully see life from his perspective as he looks back over the course of his life and all the lessons that he learned and all the faithfulness that he saw of his God in his life. I want to give us three ways that we can find strength in some of the most difficult moments of our lives. If you're taking notes, I know that you are because we are a note-taking church around here and we know we are three times more likely to remember what this amazing pastor said when I write it down. And so the first thing I want you to write down. The first way we can find strength in the middle of the storm is number one is to develop a personal history with God. Personal history. Just so you know, I got a towel up here and you know I ain't playing when I got a towel. I just want you to know right now we about to do this thing up here. Come on, we got to develop a personal history with God. Two key words in this point. That's personal and history. Everybody say personal. Everybody say history. Personal, in, in other words, man, I, I know the heart of God. I know his heartbeat. I, I know how he thinks. There's an intimacy that we have with God. There's a closeness that we have with him. With him. How many of us know that's developed? Just like any relationship that we have, it takes time to develop a personal relationship, a closeness. I was reminded of this just the other day, this past week. I was talking to my 15-year-old son. I was asking him questions uh, about something, and then... I asked him like three or four questions, and we're having a conversation. And then out of, out of nowhere, he goes, no. I go, no. What do, you, what do you mean? He goes, no, the next question you're going to ask me is no. I already know what you're going to ask me, Dad. And the answer is no. Because <laughs> he knows what Dad's thinking. He knows what Dad's going to ask him. But what he didn't know, church, is I know my son. <laughs> and I already knew the answer was no. So I wasn't even going to ask him that question because I already knew. No, you didn't do it. Come on, why? Because there's a closeness that we have. He knows how I'm thinking, and I know how he's behaving. I know, son. Right? How many know God wants us to have that kind of relationship with him? And he already knows everything about us. So it's our turn. Let me develop this. Let me spend time with him. Let me develop this personal relationship with God. And then the other word is history. Come on. In other words, we've been through some tanks. We got a history together. Anybody got a friend like that? We just, anybody got a childhood friend that we grew up with, man? We have just, we've been through some things. I remember that they knew me back then. They know, they know some of the, my, my secrets. They know some of the things I don't want anybody else to know. They've been through some of the thick and thin moments of my life, man. I got some roll dog. We've been through some things. We got history together. We know each other. We stood by each other in some of the darkest moments. How many know nobody stood by us like Jesus has? Nobody has been as faithful as God. Nobody has sacrificed as much as Jesus has sacrificed for us. He's going, oh, let's I want you to develop a personal history with me. Take a look at how David describes this personal relationship and history that he has with God. Let's look at another one of his songs, uh, Psalm chapter 63, verse 1 through 3. We'll start off. Take a look how it starts. David singing, writing here. He says, you, God, are my God. Everybody say, my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you, God. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. In other words, I've been in your house. I've been in church and I've encountered God's presence in a way that marked me. 
I've had, some, I've had some moments in prayer in your house, God, where I encountered your love, I encountered your presence, I encountered your grace, and you marked me. I was different from that moment. And in that moment, that's how I many I said, I'm building history. I'm developing a personal relationship with him. It goes on, verse 3, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. My prayer for all of us today is that we wouldn't just know this truth in our head, but we would know this truth in our heart. Your love is better than anything else. Your love is better than anything else in life. Verse 6 says, on my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings, the closeness. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. David had this personal relationship with God. And what's interesting about God's people during this time is whenever they would go to prayer, go into battle, they would, they would call on, on the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, who's been faithful from generation to generation, which is a beautiful thing. That's awesome. But I love how David gives us this example today of how it was personal to him. Remember how he started this song? No, you are God, my God. You're not just the God of Abraham. You're my God. You're not just the God of Isaac. You're my God. You're not just the God of Jacob. You're my God. This example that, that David is giving to us is important for us to know because when we find ourselves in some of the toughest seasons of life, that we're not calling on the God of our grandma. We're not calling on the God of our parents or the God of our pastor. No, when I find myself in some of the darkest, loneliest moments of my life, I'm calling on my God, my Lord, my King. Why? Because I have a personal relationship with Him. You know, I was just a reminder of this growing up. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, about three hours from Kansas City, where my, my grandparents, Papa and Nana, lived. And uh, maybe you've heard me talk about them. They played a huge role in uh, me coming to know Jesus and kind of had a love-hate relationship whenever I would go visit them uh, throughout the year because I knew every time we would visit them, we would pray, we'd talk about Jesus, we'd go to church. And I wasn't living for God, so it was a little bit of a, I didn't want to do those things, yet they had a joy and a compassion that I just knew they had something I didn't have. And so I loved being around them. At the same time, I knew I wasn't living the way I should live. And, and my, my grandma was just an incredible woman of God. I mean, even when her hands were stiff from arthritis, the, she still had the joy of the Lord, a smile. You, you never knew all the difficulties that she was going through. She never showed it because she just had the joy of the Lord as her strength. I remember even towards the end of her life when she would be in the hospital, uh, she'd be in the hospital bed, she just would witness to if anybody else that they rolled into her room was getting saved. She was give, give, gonna give them a dose of the Holy Ghost. That's how my grandma rolled. Like, oh, bring them on in, you know? I'm gonna tell them about Jesus and that's just how she was. And they were just... Papa and Nana were just an incredible example of what it looked like to become a Christian and to be a Christian. But how many of us know none of that mattered if it didn't become personal to me? None of that mattered. If the story isn't personal to us, it doesn't matter who our grandparents were. It doesn't matter who our parents are. It doesn't matter even who our pastor is. It won't make a difference if it's not personal to us. And so let me ask this a question. Do we have a personal relationship with God? Do we know him? Have we made that decision I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, I have decided to follow Jesus. Have we had these moments where we're reading the Bible and God spoke to us in a way that marked us? God spoke to us, to us in a way that, man, I'm, there's no way, in, I, there's no other way to explain it other than God spoke to me. Have we had moments in prayer where we've encountered God's presence? Have we had moments, like David said, in the sanctuary where God's presence and his hand was upon us and he marked us and he changed us because we're developing a, a personal history with God? In other words, I'm not just listening to someone else pray, I'm praying. I'm not just listening to someone else read the Bible, I'm reading the Bible and I'm developing this relationship with God so that when I find myself in a difficult season, there's one that I know, I already know his voice. I already know his presence, and I'm running to him in some of the darkest moments of my life. Amen? So that's the first way. The second way we can find strength in some of the difficult seasons and moments of our life. Number two, write this down, and that is we need to hear and obey God's voice. God, it's too important. It's important for me to hear, 
but also I got to obey God's voice. Anybody else besides me, sometimes God tells me to do something I really don't want to do. So I've got to not only hear what God wants me to do, but then I've got to have the courage and the faith to obey it even if I don't want to. Because the reality is that we might not know what the future holds, but how many of us know we know who holds the future? God, you're in control, and I trust you. We gotta, when we find ourselves in a difficult season, when life has maybe knocked the wind out of us, it is crucial and important for us to hear and obey God's voice. And this is something we see David do throughout his entire life. In fact, let's take a look at one time in particular, 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 8 through 11. I love this story. It says this. It says, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all of Israel... They mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told that they were coming. And so what did David do when he found out his enemy was coming against him, that were coming to attack him? David marched out to meet them. Come on, what an example. Maybe some of us need to do the same thing. You've heard that the enemy is coming against you. Come on, we're not running from it. We're running through it. I'm going to go out and meet my enemy in battle. But, he, but notice what he does next. Verse 9. The Philistines arrived and made a raid in the valley of Ephraim. So David did what? David asked God. He, he had to hear the voice of God. Should I go out and fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me, God? And the Lord replied, yes. Go ahead, I will hand them over to you. And so David and his troops went up to Baal Perazim, pretty good, and defeated the Philistines there. And notice, notice what David exclaimed and said after God gave them the victory. God did it! Not me, not my own strength, not my army, not my own ability. No, my strength and my faith is in God. And God gave me the victory to the point that he used me to burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So they named that place Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who bursts through. He, he renamed that entire land. How I many know God wants us to break through even in the most difficult moments of our lives? David faced one of the greatest challenges he'd ever faced in his life from the Philistines immediately after he became king. And he asked God, should I go out and fight or should I stay? And God gives him the victory. Then David renames this entire region where the battle took place. So in the future, people would know of God's goodness to him in that place. It was known as the place of breakthrough. Man, I wonder, I wonder how many of us have some places like that in our lives that we just forgot the name. A place where God gave us the breakthrough. Anybody? Anybody got some victories in your life that God gave to you? Anybody besides me used to be addicted to pornography, but God gave me the victory? Anybody else has some addictions and some struggles, but God gave me the victory? Come on, we need to go back and rename them a place of breakthrough. Not that I did anything, but my God, my King was faithful to me in that moment. I want to remind myself, God gave me the breakthrough. Well, how did he give us a breakthrough? We heard his voice and we just obeyed him. It wasn't my strength, it wasn't my ability, it was God's ability, God's wisdom, God's goodness that gave me the victory. The place where David heard God's voice and obeyed him, the place of breakthrough. What's interesting, if you go on to, to read the rest of that chapter, we don't have time, so I'll just tell you about it, so we're kind of doing it anyways. That's how, pre, that's how pastors slip in extra things in their sermon. But if you go on to read the verses, the Philistines, after they were defeated in battle, they go back and they regroup. And they come back to attack David. And David asks God again, what should he do? And God gives him the strategy. Don't attack them head on. Go around them and attack them from behind. And David heard the voice of God, obeyed the voice of God, attacked them from behind. And God gave him the victory again. I mean, it's important for us to hear the voice of God and have the courage to, to obey it. That doesn't make sense, God, to go around and attack them from behind. How are we going to do that? I don't have to understand. I don't have to know. I don't have to figure out your plan, God. My job is obedience. Our job is obedience. God's job is outcome. Amen? And so, so to kind of find strength in some of the most difficult moments of our lives, we've got to develop this personal history with God. We've got to hear and obey God's voice. And then number three, write this down, and that is we've got to run with the right crew. We've got to run with the right crew, church. David found strength in his story because he had the right people around him. Can I just remind us today to be careful who we surround ourselves with? In fact, let me say it like this. The crew we keep will either lift us up in strength or drag us down with despair. 
People will either drain us or they'll drive us toward our destiny. So we need some people around us that will strengthen us. Hey, when I don't have any faith, I need some people around me who have faith for me. When I feel like quitting, I need some people around me who come and pick me up and say, no, you're not quitting. We've come too far. We've overcome too much. Come on, get back up. We're going to follow God in the places he's calling us to go. Come on, I need some people around me who cause me and help me feel like I can fight hell with a water pistol. Come on, that's a boldness there. That's a confidence there. Come on, I can take on hell with a water pistol. I can take on a giant with just a slingshot. I need people who will pick us, pick us up, not knock us down. Come on, encourage us. Keep trusting. Keep believing. Keep following. Keep putting your faith in Jesus. And here's the reality. David has these people around him. They're actually known as David's mighty men. And you can read about them in 2 Samuel chapter 23. But let me just give you a uh, so list. There's 37 of them in total. But let me just give us a, uh, just a little snapshot of a few of them. Uh, one of the guys that he had around him was Jashrabim. And the Bible says this about him, that he once used his spear to kill 800 enemy warriors in a single battle. Come on, that's who, that's, if I'm going into a battle, I want him, I want Jashrabim next to me. Do your thing, brother, I'll be back here. <laughs> Another guy that he had around him was a, a guy named uh, Eleazar. The Bible says this, that once Eleazar, check this out, once Eleazar and David stood together against the Philistines, their enemy, when the entire Israelite army had fled, everybody on their side ran, and they're on the battlefield, and it's Eleazar and David and their enemy, the Philistines. And what does the Bible say about Eleazar? He killed Philistines until his hand was too tired to lift his sword. Come on, Eleazar, you're my roll dog, let's go. And another guy that he had around him, a guy named Shema. The Bible says, one time the Philistines gathered at Lehi and attacked the Israelites in a field full of lentils. The Israelite army fled, left him, dogged him out. But Shema held his ground in the middle of the field, and he didn't just hold his ground, he beat back the Philistines. These are some of the guys that David had around. No wonder David was able to overcome some of the things that he overcame. No wonder he was able to get some of the victories that he got because of the crew. He had the right people around him. How about Abishai? The Bible says he once used his spear to kill 300 enemy warriors in a single battle. These guys he surrounded himself with to get the victory. Then there's the Benaiah. Benaiah did so many heroic deeds, which include killing two champions of Moab. Moab were known as giants. He didn't just kill a couple guys from Moab, but he killed two champions from Moab. He took the lightweight and the heavyweight title from Moab. Come on, somebody. I mean, another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion. He's chasing the lions down in the pits. Let's go. I want these people around me. I'm talking about having the right crew around us, church. You got some people around you who are chasing a lion into a snowy pit? You got, some people, you got some people around you who, who will kill the enemy all around you until their hands tired of killing the enemy? I need some people around me like this. And I'm kind of joking, but I'm not. I need some spiritual warriors. Come on, parents. Are my kids making dumb decisions and I don't know what to do as a parent. I need some intercessors who are willing to get on their face and pray for my kids. Pray for my family. When I don't know, when my marriage is struggling or I'm battling this, I need some people on their face and saying, I'm praying for you. I'm believing God's going to do what only he can do in your life. I'm, I'm going to be your intercessor. I'm going to be your armor bearer in the spirit. Do we have people like that are praying for our kids right now? Because if you don't, you need them. You have people praying for you right now. You got an army around you. Come on, take, how many of us, none of us make it to the finish line on our own. None of us together. Come on, I need the right crew around me. And so th these are the men that, that David surrounded himself with. No wonder, no wonder he was able to make it through some of the most difficult moments of his life. So my question to all of us is, who do we have around us? Do we have the right crew around us? And if we don't, come on, let's get it. Let's get it. David had a personal history with God. He heard and obeyed God's voice and he had the right crew around him and he's on his deathbed reminiscing about all that God has brought him through. I mean, think about it. I mean, God brought me through this bear attack. God brought me through fighting this, this giant. 
He brought me through my father-in-law trying to kill me. He brought me through the death of my son. He brought me through the rape of my daughter. He brought me through all the battles on the battlefield. He brought me through my own moral failure. He brought, God brought me through things I never thought I could make it through. As we kind of just close today, I want us to remember the second part of that lyric that we're studying. I mean, the first part with David Rowe was like, with God's help, I can, I can run through, I can advance through a troop. But remember the second part of that lyric, that God also helped him scale the wall that was in front of him. David's testimony wasn't that he just got through it. It was that God also got him over it. How many of us know God doesn't want you just to make through some things? God wants you to get over some things that thing used to have me, but it doesn't have me anymore. I didn't run from it, I got over it. This old man is on his deathbed writing a song of victory, reminding us that God doesn't want us to just get through it, he wants us to get over it too. David said, God got me over it. He didn't just get me through it. He got me over it. He got me over my own failure. I messed up with Bathsheba. I failed, but I repented, and I kept trusting, and I kept believing, and I kept lifting my hands in worship, and I kept writing songs of praise. He didn't just get me through it. He got me over it. I want to encourage us that if we're not careful, how we handle trials will be how our kids handle trials. And I don't know about you, but I want my kids to see me even in the difficult moments of my life that I still have my hands lifted, giving God the praise he deserves. I want them to see that I still worship. I still believe. I still go to church. I still tithe. I still serve. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'll serve God on the mountain and I'll praise God in the valley because my God doesn't want to just get me through some things. He wants to be getting over those things too. I just want to encourage us. It's time. Come on, it's time. Somebody say it's time. It's time for me not just to get through this. Come on, it's time for you not just to get through this, whatever this is right now in your life. It's time for you to get over it. God wants us to get over our past, over our failures, over it in Jesus' name. Come on, let's stand in this place. I'm gonna end a little bit differently today. I'm gonna end with some worship. And there's no worship team, so I'm worshiping. I just feel right now in this moment, there's some things that we have in our lives that we're trying to get through and it's time to get over. And I don't know what those things are, but God knows. So we're just gonna have a time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite the prayer team to come down front. I don't even know if you're in here, but they'll get here. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you just need to come down and maybe confess some things. Or maybe you need to come down and get some prayer warriors some Benayas, some Eleazars around you, some Jashel beams around you to agree with you, to fight these battles together. Come on, I'm struggling with this. I'm trying to get through this. I'm ready to get over it in Jesus' name. And we're gonna pray and we're gonna believe. And I'm just saying, if hey, you gotta go, I'll, I'll release you now, but I, I feel like God wants to do some work right now in this place. There's some things that we're carrying. There's some things we brought into this place that aren't meant to leave with us. And I say, let's leave them at the altar. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. Let's, let's not just get through some things. Let's get over it. Come on, let's lift our hands in this place. Father, we love you in this place. God, we come before you in faith, knowing right now, just believing right now, you're speaking. Holy Spirit, speak to us in such a way as only you can. If there's some things, there's some, some dark days that we've been walking through. There's some, some addictions. There's been some pain. There's been some loss. There's been some heartache. There's been some, some struggles in our marriage. There's been some health issues. We've just been trying to keep our head above water. We've been just trying to make it through. But today is the day we draw a line in the sand. I'm not just trying to get through it, I'm gonna get over it. But not in my own strength, Father. I need you to go before me to fight my battles. I need you to give me the strength. I need you to give me the victory. So Holy Spirit, have your way right now. Give us the faith to hear your voice and obey whatever you're calling us to do. That we would do some work in, in the spirit in this place. We worship you. We need you. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship the king. Let's flood these altars. Let's trust God in a way we've never trusted him before. Do what only you can do, God. 
ask for healing in Jesus' name, that you would heal in, in such a way as only you can, that you would deliver in such a way as only you can as they step out in faith, as they just trust you, as they say, I don't care what anybody else thinks, I want the life that you have for me, God. I pray that you would do what only you can do. God, we join our faith together with their faith, that you would move. Holy Spirit, have your way. We trust you in this place. As we continue praying with every head bowed and every eye closed, as we talk today, about having a personal relationship with God, maybe you would say, man, I, I don't have a personal relationship with God. I've never decided to follow Jesus to the point where there's no turning back. Here's my life, I'm going forward. I'm following, no, though none go with me, still I will follow. Or maybe you walked with God at one point in time, but your life has drifted from Him. I wanna give you an opportunity today to put your faith in God, to surrender your life to Him. It's more than just praying a prayer, it's a decision. Here's my life, God. I'll follow you wherever you're calling me to go. And if that's you, if you need to make a decision for Jesus, come on, would you just lift your hand to heaven as a sign of surrender? Come on, put both hands up as a sign of surrender. Here's my life, God. I wanna know you. I wanna have a closeness with you. I wanna know you in a personal and real way. And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer? God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay the price for my sin on the cross. God, in this moment, in this place, here's my life. God, forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, we're gonna keep worshiping King Jesus. We're gonna let him do his thing. Then we'll close here in a moment. Come on. Can we pray and believe? Even if we don't have something, can we pray for those at the altar? Can we worship the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come on, we worship you in Jesus' name. 